Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for the opportunity you've given us to feast on your word together. Filter out all that which is foolishness, that we might grow in grace and in truth. That we might grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. Seal to our hearts that truth. Help us to understand that you are in control of every aspect of our lives. That everything that comes from your loving hand is a gift that's meant for our good. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. All things are yours. We're studying together in uh, 1 Corinthians, and in our last study together, we just finished verse 20 of chapter 3. The uh, strict overall context in our last few studies has been the world's wisdom. And I pointed out how that uh, essentially in this context, it's a theological wisdom. Uh, our Lord Jesus Christ says, Marvel not that the world hates you. It hated me before it hated you. It'll put you out of the synagogue. It'll put you to death thinking it does God sacrifice. To me, that clearly indicates that his reference to a world system was a religious system, a, an ecclesiastical system, and uh, we are counseled by the Holy Spirit here not to deceive ourselves. If any man seems to be wise in, in that world system, then he'd be better off to becoming a fool in order to actually become wise. Uh, indicating that a, uh, a religious system such as this is a system of foolishness. And we looked at verse 21, Therefore let no man boast in men, for all things are yours. All things are yours. That's what we're going to talk about in this video. And folks, I've got to be very careful and very sensitive when I do that. That is what this world religious system does. It boasts in men. And now we see that in verse 22, the Holy Spirit repeats that statement. All things are yours. So I think that's important. And we should look at that. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And boy, that sounds remarkable. That sounds exciting. And I, I hope you see the connection here because it's the world religious system that would read those words, uh, all things are yours, as if they meant God wants us to be uh, healthy and wealthy, uh, you know, all the time. Uh, nothing bad happens to us. Uh, uh, because it, if, if that's not the case, then we lack the faith. We lacked enough faith. We didn't have enough faith. Uh, or monetary investment or something else to make those incredible words a reality in our lives. So the question in my mind is, what does the Holy Spirit mean in this context of, of world wisdom by the phrase, all things are yours? What did he mean? You know, how do we approach this book? Is it really important that we know what God's telling us? Are we reading this like we might read a, a blueprint for how we should be building our own personal lives? You know, there's plenty of self-help books out there for that. I'm certain that among Christians there are levels of that meaning, but folks, this is a simple verse. Only four or five words in my Bible. Just several lines. Don't let any man boast in men. Now, that makes sense to me because wisdom is, is Christ. Christ has been made unto us wisdom. And that wisdom is from the Lord. 
The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. So don't boast in men. Don't boast in their thoughts, their ideas, their philosophies. For all things are yours. Now in looking at this passage in the original Greek, there are three neuters. I believe that is by design. And I recognize that the Lord does the designing, but it's my design to finish the third chapter tonight. So uh, no matter how far we get in this video, chapter three is done. We'll start uh, chapter four in the next video. So there's three neuters here. The all things, it's the Greek word for all, uh, pas, but, but it's in the neuter gender, so it's translated all things. Um, it's not masculine or feminine, it's neuter. All things, present, and, and then we have all things to come. So we have three of those in these very few verses. All things are yours. Now that is a fantastic statement of four simple words. In fact, none of those words are more than one syllable. All things are yours. It amazes me, you know, what God Almighty can say in just a few simple words. All things are yours. And man, that sounds exciting. One of those things, I believe, is your body. You know, it might be handsome, it may be ugly, it may be weak, it might be strong, it may be male, it may be female. You know, that's something. Your mind is another. You know, that, that's another thing. I think they're all yours. You know, why are they yours? Well, because God gave them to you. So he gave you your body. He gave you your mind. He gave you your looks. He gave you your husband. He gave you your wife. He gave you your kids. He gave you your car, your job. He gave you your home. He gave you the weeds in the garden. He gave you everything. All things are yours, okay? And I'm trying to be as sensitive as I can here, but folks, he gave you the cancer. He gave you the cataracts. He gave you the broken wrist. He gave you the sickness. He gave you the illness, the aches, the pains. But he gave you the money. He gave you the fun, the vacations. He gave you the fellowship. Or he gave you the no fellowship. He gave you the mountaintop. He gave you the desert. He gave you your friends, your pets. And I could go on and on. All things are yours. Why? Because God gave them to you. A sovereign, majestic God gave them to you. Now, I'm persuaded that most of us, and, and I, I've got to include myself, are not always happy with the things that our Heavenly Father gave us. And that saddens me deeply. The world's wisdom is foolish. I won't mention names. I don't like doing that. But I listened to a woman preacher on TV the other night trying to tell me how God wanted me to be healthy, always wanted me to be healthy, healthy always wanted me to be happy, always, you know, and if I wasn't, and rich too, and if I wasn't, it was because I wasn't trusting God enough. I didn't have enough faith. Folks, these are clear, clearly, these are cleverly devised fables. The world's wisdom is foolishness to God. The truth is that if God never wanted me sick, I'd never be sick. The foolishness of the world wants me to believe that if I have trouble in my life, if I have trouble in this life, it's my fault, okay? If those things happen, God doesn't want that. She, she had no idea what this verse was talking about. The wisdom, wis, the wisdom of the world, the wise, the wisdom of the world is just that. If there are problems in your life, it's your fault. You shouldn't have made that mistake. You shouldn't have made that investment, that bad investment. You shouldn't have gone there you shouldn't have gone there, here, there, wherever, you know, wherever you went. You shouldn't have eaten that food, you know, and on and on and on, ad nauseum, all right? Most of those who profess to be Christians would never blame God. 
I mean, they're not going to blame him. They know it's not his fault. It's their fault. But that's, that's a false wisdom, a foolish wisdom. I'm asking you people to stop and think about these five simple words. For all things are yours. God loved you so much that Christ Jesus left the glory of heaven. He left the adulation of the angels and he became flesh to die in your place. You know, what to us is stars above our head is to him dust beneath his feet. He took upon himself the form of a servant. You know, I wonder if any of us could possibly imagine that step that he took. from the sovereign God, the sovereign majestic God who spoke the worlds into existence to a servant. I don't know what heaven's like. We were talking about that last night on Facebook. I've had people ask me that for many years, but I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is the value, the, the worth that shall be revealed in us. I believe that's talking about our our glory, our value. Our word means an estimation of one's value, our worth to God. How much are we worth to God? So it's got to be something. When he was in Jerusalem, he knew all about flies. He also knew about screen doors. He knew about germs. I mean, couldn't he have taken just 15 or 20 minutes out of his earthly ministry to at least instruct the doctors a little bit about germs, blood transfusions and, and screen doors on restaurants, but he didn't. You know, we think those things are very important today. I'm sure he knew all about those things, but that was not the importance of his mission, his purpose. Dearly beloved, his mission was to redeem you. It was because of an intense, his intense love for you that was eternal and never changing. But folks, he left what you and I can't even begin to describe in glory and wonder to wander muddy streets of filth so that he might be my redeemer. You know, now just try and comprehend if you can is dying in our place. You know, okay, the job's done. He forgets you. He's redeemed you and he goes away. That's it. It's done. But he didn't do that. He said, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. Think about that, folks. I send you forth as sheep among wolves. No human shepherd in his right mind would do such a thing as that. Got to be the dumbest shepherd that ever lived that would send his sheep forth among wolves. Why did he do that? He did that because sheep don't have a chance. They don't stand a chance against wolves. They have to rely on him. They have to learn daily, day after day, who he is and what he's done in their life. But the wisdom of the world the wisdom of the world says you are the victor. You made the decisions. You made the choices. You did the battle. You did the fighting and you won or you lost. Depending on how you performed or how you behaved. But you can't say that to sheep among wolves. They're not equipped for the battle on their own. But he is. He's our shepherd. It is not the, the sheep's job to fight off the wolves. That's the shepherd's job. And if he doesn't do it, well, he's a rotten shepherd. The sovereign God, the sovereign majestic God that I know, the, the sovereign God sits here in this text and he says he's given me all things. And immediately my mind wants all the good things or it thinks about all the good things. Or that verse is talking about all the good stuff. And somehow the bad things, well, they, they got to be my fault. 
I believe that God Almighty giving you a million dollars or cancer is the same thing. And folks, that's a hard thing for me to say, but that is the truth. That what you need is what you have. Good health, poor health, job, no job, and I could go on and on. Dearly beloved, do you understand that all of those things are yours because he gave them to you? I cannot pass a verse like this without sitting in my study in utter amazement that what God says makes a tremendous difference in your life. Wouldn't it make a, a dramatic difference no matter what comes to be able to say, my father, my heavenly father gave that to me. He didn't give it to me because he hates me. He didn't give it to me to punish me. He didn't give it to me because I earned it. Okay? There's nothing in the text that says we earned all things. He didn't give it to, to punish me. Anytime you ever ask God why, the answer is because I love you. You're mine. I love you. You're mine. I died in your place. And I demonstrated that love by dying in your place. Now you can do whatever you want with those words. For all things are yours. I'm sure that many, many people have just done what they want with those words. All things are yours. And they just make, out, make it out to be what they want them to be. But in the present context, I hear God telling me that all things are mine because he gave them to me. Good or bad. No difference. They, they couldn't be mine any other way. I didn't buy them. It's not whether or not I deserve them. It's, it's, even, it's even in the context, I didn't buy them. I didn't provide them. I, I, had, I had no way of doing this. I don't really know why God does what he does in my life. I really, truly, honestly don't. I don't know what he, why he does what he does in your life. But I trust him. And I'm willing to take all things as a gift from him. A gift. We know that all things work together for our good. We know that verse. Do we believe that, folks? Do we really believe it? I've had people say, you can't take that verse and make it spiritual things. The phrase is all things. That verse says that all things work together for your good. And I say, what good am I interested? What am I interested in? All right, the, the only possible good that is, has any interest to me is spiritual good. It might be for my spiritual good, for me to be physically af afflicted. We see examples of that through the Gospels, folks. I know you have. Blind, people blind, deaf. I'm persuaded that... Well, neither life, nor death, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor any other creation can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are you that persuaded? You should be. Because everything, I've, I've said this over and over again, everything that touches you comes from your loving Heavenly Father, Okay? Now, I know that's hard. I know that's hard because people say, Steve, that's not true. I made the mistake. I'm the guy that got drunk and drove when I shouldn't have and had a wreck. Okay? I picked that example as just one. There are hundreds of others that I could use as, as examples. I decided to do this, that, or the other thing when I, when I shouldn't have I shouldn't have done this I knew this was wrong but I did it anyway and we make a thousand excuses trying to defend God but I have this word all not just the nice things but all things all things are yours the ingrown toenail the sovereignty of God seems to irritate a lot of people I, I spent a bit of time on the 10th verse of this chapter. I spent a lot of time on God's sovereignty throughout all these studies. Let every man take heed how he builds. Why should he take heed? I mean, the buildings of God, the, the increases of God, 
God is doing the building. He's doing it through you to be sure, but he's do is he doing it poorly? Is God doing something to his building that isn't very good because you're not very good? Or is God, in fact, working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure in that building? That is what Scripture says. This prosperity religious stuff is junk, folks. If the increase is of God, it's a good increase. Nobody could convince me that the increase in the building is a poor increase. You know, my God is perfect. His work in our lives is perfect. We're talking about perfection here because we're talking about God. The work that he does is perfect. So I pointed out that the result of our judgment before God is a matter that deals with the heart, with attitude, with motive. Did God ordain my heart, my, my attitude, my motive? Did God ordain all that, or was that something outside God's will? And I, and I suggest that he does, just as he did in the case of Joseph's brothers. That's just one example he ordained every aspect of our lives, but it's still something we're going to give an account for. I will never, never retract from any position that says, my God is not in control. If God isn't in control for, for one microsecond, folks, we're done. We're done. I don't, I don't know what more to say. All things are yours. The clothes that you're wearing, the car you drive, what you're going to do after you get through watching this video. I can't imagine anybody not being thrilled with resting in the peace of God. Don't worry about anything. But with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Folks, you know these verses. I'm sure you've read these verses. Nothing can separate you from his love. Oh, Steve, I just don't feel God loves me. And, and I know he ordains every step of my life. I don't lay out my own steps. And folks, if that makes me a puppet, well, there's no person I'd rather have pull the strings. Although I don't think I'm a puppet. I think I have volition. I don't think it does much. But sure, I can, I can decide what I'm going to eat. I can decide where I'm going to go. I can decide what I'm going to wear. But folks, I have to see behind all of that the hand of the sovereign God. And, and this God, this sovereign God, is not pulling any punches here. In the simplest of language, he says to you and to me, all things belong to you. All things are yours. I gave them to you. You didn't buy them. I didn't buy them. You didn't deserve them. I didn't deserve them. So how did we get them? Or are we going to say, well, that verse isn't true. You know, it says all things are yours. It, it means the Corinthians. You know, that's just the Corinthians. or that, that just, That's just talking about Paul or Apollos, but not us. I, folks, I can't do that. This is God's word. Profitable for reproof for doctrine, for instruction in righteousness. I want to suggest that all things means all things. Now, as radical as that may sound, that's what I think it means. And God says all things are yours, given to you and me by God. God gave Joseph to be sold into slavery, thrown into a pit. That's what he gave Joseph. And it turned out for good because it's the way God works. That's the way God works. That's the way God planned it. We see the same thing with the crucifixion of, of our Lord in, in the case of his death for us. And Israel, your Bible shows example after example of this, and yet we still find this hard to handle. We, we find it hard to wrap our mind around the, the fact that no, nothing comes to us in, except through God's loving hands. Don't worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication 
let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace, the peace of God that passes understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Do you know that peace of God in every situation? Do you know that peace in every situation, the good situations, the bad situations, in every moment of every hour of, of your day, do you know that you have peace with God? That God has nothing against you? Romans 5.1 I, I can't imagine any of us ever arguing with God. I don't want to argue with God. I'm sure he'd win. Let no man boast in men for all things are yours, but that's not what I saw on TV the other night. That's not what the wisdom of this world teaches. You know, it's based on your effort. You know, that's how the world turns, you know. I mean, you know, look, you know it. I know it. We were born into this, this system. We all know those that who succeed. We know those who succeed or those who really deserve it, right? Right. And, and we built a system that is entirely based upon production, ability, performance. That's the system we know. This is the system, that's the only system we've ever known. But then here comes Christianity. And it turns all that on its head. It's not true in the theological realm. Those who are really, really, really good Christians, well, you know, Steve, those go to church on Sunday morning. You know, Sunday evening and Wednesday night. That's, that's, those are the super Christians. You know, those who are fair Christians, well, they go Sunday morning and Sunday evening. And, and then those who are just, well, general Christians, well, they just only go on Sunday morning. And of course, those who don't go at all, well, they're not good. They're, there's nothing good about them at all. All things includes every single affliction that ever entered your life. Every difficulty, every sin, every opportunity, everything that was good and everything in your eyes that appears to be bad from a human perspective. It's not. It was a gift from your heavenly Father and it was for your good. All things are yours. All things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas I don't have to exalt Paul. I don't have to say, I am of Paul. God gave Paul to me. Probably every one of us have had uh, people in our lives that have been teachers and mentors and, and a, a people of great help. I know I have, and I, I'm sure you have. I think most Christians have. We, we don't seem to have any problem believing them to be a gift from God. But what about... The, the desert, the dry times. Do they not serve any purpose at all? What about false teachers? Oh, no, they can't be possibly be from God. Folks, I'm going to suggest they are. They're there to cause you to study, to get you to study. They're there to show you the difference, to contrast darkness and light. Study this book. Does God work through error to teach us truth? I believe he does. Think of the worst thing, folks, that ever has ever happened to you in your life. Was that of God or was God on vacation? Did God bring that into your life? Absolutely. I believe he did. One of the reasons I believe God brought false teachers into my life is that I, is, is so I didn't consider that to be the truth anymore. Our shepherd said he sent us out as sheep among wolves. I don't know what all Paul did. I don't know that, uh, what all the problems there was in Paul's life. But we're going to hear Paul saying very shortly here, we're going to hear him say that he didn't judge himself. He knew that all things were his also. But God gave these Corinthian believers Paul. He gave them Paul. They don't have to say, I'm of Paul. Paul is simply a gift from God to them. 
You know, Paul's like, like their car, their house, their clothes, whether it's Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world, the world is yours. The reason God has a legalistic merit-based religious system is for you. Your life is given to you by God. The very life that you have, that's the life God gave you. And if you don't like it, well, take it up with him. It's not, I'm not being unsympathetic to anyone's difficulties. You know, well, this guy's got a better life than me. I, I don't know how to answer that. You know, I don't see why anybody should be as handsome as me. You know, that just, that just happens that way. Maybe God knows that if I were ugly, I couldn't handle it. I don't know. I hope you laughed at that. Dearly beloved, the life you have is his gift to you. If God wanted you poor, why would you want to be anything else? If God wants you sick, why would you want to be anything else? If he wants you in one place, why would you want to be anywhere else? Resisting God. I know that's a really hard saying, folks, but I'm not going to lie to you just to get views. I don't know why God does what he does, but I trust him. I really trust him. Folks, did, did you ever think of death as a gift from God? Personally, I can, I, I can hardly wait. You know, you pray me out of heaven, I'll haunt you. I know that I have a hope that exceeds my expectations. I've had enough of this life, enough of its situations, but it's what God gave me. I'm content to be here as long as he would have me here. It is my life is what God gave me, and I'll rejoice in it. And I'll go home when he brings me home. So will you. Not one moment before. Whether things present or things to come, they're all yours. They are yours, dearly beloved. They're, I don't see how you can do anything but jump up and say, praise God, they're mine. He gave me these things. He gave me all things, all things, present things to come, death, life. But it goes on. And we have two genitives here in the text. You know, that show possession. You are Christ's. Christ is God's. That's who you belong to. The sooner we realize that we're his, the sooner we can understand how and why he does what he does in our lives, how he can do what he wants to with us because he owns us. He bought us with a price. We know what that price was. Can God do with his own as he pleases? Yes. Yes. Not only can he, he does. He will. We belong to Christ, but no, we want something better than, than him. And I'm sorry to have to tell you just how sad that, that that makes me, because he has redeemed the people who cannot sin, who are new creations in Christ Jesus, and that all of that to his glory. And Christ is God's. Christ is God's. I said I'd finish the chapter, so I will. I don't think, I don't think that that means Christ is less than God, folks. And I don't think that that means that, that Christ here means only the incarnate Christ, but I think it does mean the person in the work of Christ in a, in a redemption that is subject to God. He came to do the Father's will. So ultimately, we're in God's hands. The all Mighty, sovereign, eternal God. Why should that scare us or frighten us? That's, that, that is whose hands you and I are in. We're his. I can't imagine anything greater. I can't imagine anything more exciting. I don't even know how to put that in words, that we are his. Dearly beloved, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in him. Look to him in all circumstances of your, of your life. Trust him. 
Until next time, thanks for watching.